Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our third and last webinar of uh, the NeuroDrain project. Uh, today, we will talk about filter technologies to remove nitrates from agricultural waters. Okay, um, before we really start, I just want to give some practical um, arrangements. So I want to ask all uh, attendees to keep yourself muted during the presentations. Uh, if you have a question during the, the presentations, feel free to put them in the chat. I will then uh, read them out loud during the Q&A. Uh, after each presentation, uh, or if you want to unmute yourself to ask your question directly, you can also do so. Uh, this webinar is recorded and after the words, we will put available the video and also the handouts on the NuriDrain websites. Okay, I will first start with a brief introduction about the NuriDrain project. Uh, it's about nutrient removal and recovery from drainage water. This project is funded by the Interreg North Sea Region program, and we are 11 partners cooperating uh, between three countries, being uh, Denmark, Germany, and Belgium. The goal of our project is to combat eutrophication, uh, and we do so by uh, installing end-of-pipe filter technology to remove uh, nitrates and phosphates from agricultural related waters. And we have um, four project goals. First of all, we aim to develop uh, filter technologies that can remove at least 50% of nitrogen, 70% of phosphorus, uh, and we hope to reuse at least 20% of the phosphorus saturated filter materials. And in the end, we uh, aim that 40 organizations will be adopting our filter systems. So we mainly focus on drainage water, but we also consider uh, greenhouse effluent, uh, surface water and uh, water coming from a water reservoir for drinking water production. So throughout the project, we have six field cases, all spread around the three countries. And today uh, we will present you the results that we obtained from our filter technologies to remove uh, nitrogen. So with that, I would like to give the floor to Adrian from the University of Copenhagen, and he will um, tell us some more about the zero valence iron filter. Okay, Adrian, go ahead. Yes. With... Okay. Hello, everybody. So, I'll uh, start my presentation. So, my name is Adrian, and I will uh, have a short presentation about uh, zero violent iron filter system used for uh, nitrogen and uh, phosphorus removal. Uh, I'm from uh, University of Copenhagen. So, uh, the idea of this filter was based on uh, the nitrogen wheel, which starts with uh, ammonia production from atmospheric uh, uh, nitrogen uh, to the Haber-Bosch uh, process, and uh, used of uh, nitrogen-based fertilizers. And after this, ammonium can be oxidized to nitrogen, uh, nitrate, and nitrate can leach from agricultural drainage, agricultural soils into drainage water. And one of the process to to remove nitrate, uh, one of the main processes is denitrification, uh, but this actually can return uh, nitrogen uh, again to atmosphere, and we have to produce more uh, reactive nitrogen through the Haber-Bosch method. And with our uh, filter system, we wanted to shorten a little bit the nitrogen cycle. So, <clears throat> as we can see on this image. Uh, by using uh, zero violent iron after the nitrate leaching, we wanted to reduce again the nitrate to ammonium and then retain ammonium and reuse it as fertilizer. So we could actually recycle the nitrogen that can be lost through the denitrification process. So our uh, objective was to develop a filter system that can remove nitrate and recover nitrogen from agricultural drainage water, and we develop a field scale uh, filter 
and the principle of this filter is based on the stoichiometric re reaction when using zero valent iron material can reduce nitrate to ammonium with a 100% conversion. The filter system was uh, formed from three units. First uh, unit or section, uh, it's a zero violent iron unit, which is uh, filled with zero violent iron mixed with sand. And for our unit, we used approximately 45 kilograms of, of zero violent iron material. And this is responsible for uh, nitrate reduction to, to ammonium process. The second unit, we call it the oxidation unit. Uh, this is very important because uh, we wanted to remove the iron two formed in the nitrate reduction process by zero violent iron, as we can see in this reaction. There's a lot of iron two uh, formed in the process. And in this section, we try to pump air through an air bubbler and uh, to oxidize the uh, iron two formed in the process. And the third section uh, filled with zeolite. And this section, uh, we use it to retain the whole, all the ammonium uh, formed in the process. In this uh, field uh, experiment, we used approximately 70 kilograms of zeolite, uh, which is a natural volcanic rock. It's a good uh, cation. Uh, trap and have a high affinity for, for ammonium. Uh, and uh, in this, we pretreated pre the zeolite with uh, sodium chloride. So we had sodium as exchangeable cation. The flow in the filter system was one liter per minute. And the retention time for each unit was from 35 to 45 minutes. So the results. To measure the nitrate efficiency of zero violent iron, we uh, took some samples from the outlet of zero violent iron column, and we can see a uh, high removal efficiency regardless the initial concentration of, of nitrate or uh, yeah of, or, of nitrate, and the average of nitrate reduction over the entire running period was 94% nitrate removed. Further, we wanted to see if the nitrate is actually converted to ammonium. So we also measure ammonium after the zero violent iron um, unit. And we could see that in the beginning of the experiment, there was approximately 100% of nitrate reduced to ammonium. But then uh, this conversion rate dropped to approximately 70% of nitrate reduced and ammonium produced and was fluctuating during the, the whole uh, period. Uh, these results actually were similar as we had in laboratory trials. And this incom uh, incomplete conversion could be due to production of maybe some nitrogen gas species that we didn't monitor. Further, we wanted to see if the ammonium formed is actually retained in the in the third section, in the zeolite uh, uh, section. So we measure ammonium concentration before and after the retention unit. And we could see that almost 100% of the ammonium form was retained into the zeolite over the entire running period. And there uh, was no decreasing of uh, ammonium retention efficiency. And uh, this zeolite, uh, column using the field experiment had a higher efficiency comparative with the laboratory experiments. Further, as I was explaining, there was a lot of iron two uh, coming uh, from uh, nitrate uh, reduction process by zero violent iron. And we, we wanted to, to oxidize this uh, iron two because it's, it's important also for ammonium capture into the zeolite uh, layer as iron two can be a strong competitor for, for ammonium retention. And by pumping air in, in this oxidation unit, we removed 100% of the iron and uh, all the iron was transformed or oxidized into iron oxides. As we can see in this left image, uh, sample collected after the oxidation unit 
we could see a lot of iron oxides in the water. And further, we also try to see if uh, this filter have a high efficiency in phosphate uh, retention. So we measure phosphate uh, in the inlet and the outlet of zero violent iron uh, column, and then also in the outlet of uh, the oxidation unit. We could see that regardless of the concentration of phosphate, uh, almost 100% of phosphate was retained in the zero violent iron unit and uh, otherwise the rest was retained in the oxidation unit. Uh, we also spiked uh, some phosphate uh, during the experiment and we see high concentrations here in the, in the middle of, of the experiment up to 0 0.5 milligram per liter and 100% of the phosphate was retained in the columns. After we end up the experiment, we opened the columns and wanted to see how it looks inside. Uh, we also collected some solid and some uh, liquid samples and we could see uh, that the water actually had a green color, uh, which suggested that the green rust, uh, suggested a green rust formation inside the zero violent iron uh, uh, unit. And uh, what is green rust? Uh, it's an unstable corrosion product that is normally produced in uh, low oxygen environments and it's formed from iron 2, iron 3 and hydroxide uh, radical, uh, hydroxide an anion, uh, but also contain another anion such carbonate, chloride, chloride or phosphate. And uh, the green rust found in our filter system uh, was carbonate green rust. And this is important because uh, this green rust have a good potential in uh, water purification processes and also can actually reduce nitrate to ammonium. Further, we analyze also the solid uh, material uh, and uh, the same images uh, on the same analysis. We saw uh, green rust carbonate uh, formation on the surface of zero violent iron uh, particles. And this is also uh, supported by the X-ray diffraction analysis that we did. I couldn't put it here, uh, but it also suggests a green rust carbonate formation inside the, the zero violent iron filter system and filter column. Further, um, I try to make some uh, cost calculation. And for this, uh, I consider only the materials that we used for this field uh, scale filter system. Uh, so zero violent iron material that we used in this uh, experiment uh, was approximately one euro per kilogram. The zeolite was between 2.5 and three euros per kilogram. And the filter system uh, with tubings and pumps and uh, all the materials that we use, it was up to 2,000 euros. And then I wanted to, to see if uh, I can calculate uh, how much of the material we need to filtrate the water uh, per hectare per year. And here in Denmark, it's approximately 2,000 cubic meters drainage water per hectare per year. So for that, based on uh, stoichiometric reaction, we need approximately 72 kilograms of zero violent iron that will be consumed actually in the process. Uh, and approximately 500 kilograms of zeolite to retain the ammonium formed. And then having the amounts and the prices, uh, a total amount or price per hectare per year could be up to 3,500 euros. But if we consider the removal and recover of, uh, of nitrogen uh, from the 2,000, uh, cubic meter of drainage water and having the same efficiency or 100% efficiency removal and 70% efficiency of uh, ammonium formation and retention in a uh, drainage water having a concentration of uh, 10 milligram per liter uh, nitrate, then we can uh, actually retain approximately 14 kilograms of, of nitrogen per hectare per year 
in a form of, of ammonium. Of course, there's also some operational cost, but that is mainly based on electricity uh, that you need to, to have the pumps working in the filter system. And uh, regarding the filter evaluation, we had some pros and some cons about. Uh, it's, it's a good filter uh, system because can, nitrogen can be completely removed even at low concentration and low temperature. Uh, we can uh, recover the ammonium so we can enable nitrogen uh, recycle. Phosphate is fully removed. Uh, we can oxidize iron too coming from zero violent iron nitrate reduction process. And this unit can be uh, efficiently used in uh, concentrated effluents such as from greenhouses. The cons of this is just that nitrate removal can decrease over time because of uh, zero violent iron surface passivation because of corrosion layer formation. Oxygen can also consume zero violent iron, oxygen uh, found in a drainage water. And uh, this uh, water reduction can uh, generate some hydrogen gas in the column. So you have to make sure that you don't have problems operating with this hydrogen gas. It can create some pressures. And uh, you, need to, you need to have maintenance because uh, it requires aeration. So a pump needs to constantly work to remove uh, the iron tool formed. Of course, it's also a high iron consumption. And some improvements is uh, that uh, can also be a smaller zero violent iron particle used, and this can create increase the reaction efficiency. Uh, or once the efficiency drops, we can remove corrosion layers of zero violent iron particles through an acid uh, wash. And uh, we can also try to recycle the phosphate trapped into the filter system. Thank you. And this was the main. The main okay. Yeah. Factor. Thank you, Adrian. Interesting. Um, I already saw one question in the chat. So you mentioned that you trialed this now on an average concentration of uh, eight to 10 milligrams of nitrate in the drainage water. The question is if the, the nitrate concentration would be higher, for example, 50 milligrams of nitrates in, in your drainage water, how do you expect that your zero, zero valent iron filter would work then? Uh, I think it will still be a good efficiency, but probably the efficiency over time will decrease uh, because of the passivation layer formation on the zero violent iron particles. So it's also depending uh, uh, on this uh, reaction. I think it's really important to calculate how much iron do you actually need when you have high concentrations in agricultural drainage water or drainage water. So a higher concentration of nitrate in the, wa in the water could actually require a higher amount of, of zero violent iron to be used. Yeah. Okay, but it's not tested yet. So you should actually test uh, if it would work we, at higher concentrations. We tried, I tried in a laboratory, uh, only in laboratory uh, experiments with high concentration of nitrate up to 25 milligrams per liter. We had a trial and actually the efficiency was, uh, the highest efficiency I think was around 80 to 90% removed, okay. but it was a short trial over a week, I think. And, uh, uh, which I just wanted to see if, if actually, yeah, we'll work also on high concentration, but this can be optimized if you can calculate the concentration and the amount of water that you want to filtrate, then you can know exactly the amount of zero violent iron that need to be used. Okay. Yeah. Then uh, another question. Um, Olga is asking, what method do you suggest for the ammonium recovery from zeolites? Yes, we also tried that in uh, laboratory uh, experiments. Uh, well, I took the zeolite from uh, the unit and then uh, I exposed it to a potassium chloride solution, two molar concentration uh, for approximately one hour and uh, shake it. And after that, 
uh, I measured the ammonium in solution. So it was 80% of ammonium that I was expecting to be uh, retained in the zeolite was already in the solution. Yeah, okay. But so, yeah, it's still something done at, at lab scale. So we still need yes. to yeah upgrade yes. this, of course. In yeah, a, yeah. but it's promising. It would be interesting if uh, you have another container maybe with a, a solution. So you wash the column of zeolite just to to dissolve the ammonium formed and trapped in the zeolite. As you can also reactivate the zero violent iron by using uh, acid wash. Okay, yeah. Then I have another question. So you mentioned that with your filter you can remove approximately 40 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. And the question is, what would be the cost of fertilizing a field eh, with 40 kil 14 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year? And does this outbalance the investment costs of your filter being the 3,500 euro per hectare per year? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, it depends how you calculate this, because if you if you uh, already uh, start with the production of ammonia uh, to the Haberbosch uh, process, then you can actually have a high cost for 14 kilograms of nitrogen based fertilizer. And you can also you need to consume a lot of uh, methane and a lot of energy to to produce that fertilizer. Uh, comparatively, zero violent iron can come from uh, waste. And uh, that means that you don't have this high costs of the filter materials. So I think could be balanced actually, yeah. uh, somehow, if you, if you consider the energy spent to, of course, there's a lot of calculations to be made, but somehow I think, uh, yeah, could be balanced could be yeah balanced to, to use the recovered uh, nitrogen actually indeed yes. yeah and then well the question uh, additional question to this is it, if it would be working that we we can recover and reuse the nitrogen uh, and if it's uh, economically uh, yeah comparable or advantaged or even if it's a bit more expensive perhaps we would need to stimulate uh, this process by providing uh, subsidies as it also is advantage for the water quality. It's just like an extra remark on that, uh, that was given. Okay, then I go to the next question. Um, it's uh, Hans Christian, who is thanking you for your nice presentation. And he also asked how much of the zero valent iron is used for the reaction with water to produce hydrogen? Yes, that's a good question. <laughs> Uh, how much zero violent iron is used for a reaction with water to produce? Uh, it depends on the, like, it depends on the amount of water you filtrate. If, if you take it on a field scale, or maybe I didn't understand the question. I think you mentioned, or Hans Christian, so you said that one of the negative points of the filter is that the is the fact that there can be the production of hydrogen gas uh how much of the zero zero valent iron is used is consumed for the reaction that it's that you have done the production of this hydrogen gas yes i think I, i'm i'm actually <laughs> not sure because it's like only the reaction as or or like I don't know, Hans Christian, if you want, you can unmute yourself and ask the question directly. Perhaps uh, I miss. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry for an awkward uh, question. No, I, I was just, uh, I mean, you, you consider how much of the iron is being used to reduce the nitrate, but then you also say that some is producing hydrogen from the water. So, so you have a, a byproduct which is hydrogen and you even may have a little bit of oxygen in the drainage water that is also yes. consuming uh, the co line. So it's, I, I guess it's a question that is difficult to answer, but uh, 
uh, do you think it's five or ten percent of the zero valent iron that is used just for pure corrosion and hydrogen production? Ah, okay. Uh, I think this depends on the oxygen concentration in the drainage water mm. and also of the in the amount of water filtrated. So, for example, I think it's just based on, a, on a, the chemical reaction that if you maybe used to filtrate a cubic meter of water, then you can end like lose up to, I can say 10%, maybe more of, of the zero violent iron. Okay. Yeah, it's all psychometry eh? to, to make the yeah, calculations. It, it, yeah, it, yeah. Needs, it needs to be calculated. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. But it's something to pay attention to, especially if you have this yes. gas production. Yeah. Uh, then another question is, uh, how do you explain the lag time? Uh, so the fact that not 100% of the nitrates are removed at the beginning of uh, the filtering. Yeah. When you look to the curve, we see that it goes up slowly and then you have 100% removal. But why do you have such a slow increase of the removal? Yeah, uh, we also had these uh, results in the laboratory trials where it started to 60-70% in the beginning and then went up to 100% but then decreased over time. And I think uh, this is due to, to, to many factors and one of them can be the, the saturation of the column. Because having a, even if you have a low flow and up flow, you can still have some air trapped into the filter material. And where that is, then you can actually not, you're not using the whole filter material to, to filter the water. And the beginning can be some maybe preferential flows. Uh, it's also, I think, uh, it's, it's also based on this maybe reaction between uh, nitrate and the zero violent iron. Uh, as I found in literature, uh, they suggest that uh, first nitrate is uh, absorbed to the surface and then the reaction uh, starts. So can also, uh, that can also be a factor that you need some time till react, uh, reaction start to, to work uh, optimally. Yeah. It can okay. also be that you, you start aging, let's say, your column for a few hours or for a few days before taking samples so yeah or yeah okay yeah thank you um okay i have no more questions in the chats uh i think we're through that for your presentation thank you very much adrian um, thank you you can stop sharing your screen yes. and then i am happy to give the floor to sasha from OFAU and he will uh, tell us some more about uh, mobile constructed wetlands. Thank you very much. Um, hi from my side as well, and uh, thanks for joining that webinar today. Um, I am going to talk today about uh, mobile constructed wetlands at the Leder River in Germany. Uh, my name is Sascha. I'm working at the Oldenburg and East Frisian Water Board. We are a regional water supplier and um, we um, started that project uh, in a, in a yeah, area that I'm going to talk about uh, on the next slide. So I'm going to talk about the problem, the filter, I describe it with some nice pictures and uh, give you some results and then tell you what we are going to do next. So uh, here in that picture, you can see a satellite image from our, um, yeah, from our study area. So uh, the main, main focus here are those uh, fish ponds in the, uh, in the square A. Um, they have a catchment area of, or the, the pond area in total is around 120 hectares. They are inside of a natural protection area. The, the nature reserve is uh, 460 hectares roundabout, and um, the status of the nature reserve is threatened. 
uh, because of uh, shore weeds, uh, they're red listed, and uh, that is one reason uh, why the nature reserve um, yeah, is there. Um, but due to high nitrate levels stemming from uh, the, the river downstream, uh, upstream, um, they cannot compete with, with uh, other, other plants. So um, the, the owner of those fish ponds, uh, they did some extensive uh, measurements as well on the topic of nitrates and they cal cal calculated that uh, there's an annual nitrate, uh, nitrogen input of around 40 tons per year and only around one to three tons per year is leaving the system. So the rest of, of uh, that nitrate, uh, nitrogen is staying in the pond area. Um, maybe you can see it from the satellite picture as well. Um, all of that is uh, agriculture land and uh, here in the um, B square uh, we have the spring area which is also, um, yeah, there's intense ex agriculture with uh, maize and uh, special crops like uh, blueberries and uh, we have a poultry farm directly next to the spring. And um, there, most of the most of the nitrate is coming from. Uh, we did some in the last two years. We did some uh, monitoring as well. Um, here you can see on the right hand side <clears throat> the Little River, uh, the Spring area, and uh, some other tributaries. So we just wanted to see what is going on there. Um, <clears throat> so I measured here on the first uh, side, the Leta River, then there's a side ditch. The Leta ditch um, had two measurements um, or measure sites here. And uh, here's some kind of a small lake where the, where the um, Leta is training to and we want to see what's going on there as well. Um, I show you here now uh, three sites. Uh, the first site that's with the black dots that is the Leta River. The second site here on the bottom that's the Leta Ditch. And on the upper part that is uh, the Leta River in the spring area. Uh, so you can see here nicely that uh, most nitrate is coming from the spring area and the tributaries are rather decreasing the nitrate levels in, in the uh, Little River and the uh, Little Ditch because it's much smaller, the catchment is uh, really tiny, um, has very low um, nitrate levels. Yeah, and you can also see that um, from comparing from summer to winter levels, they are uh, increasing. So um, our first constru construction site, um, and remember, I'm going to show you the, the uh, mobile wetland uh, later on, but our first construction site was, was here on the later ditch. Um, this was rather a test to show the, the um, river owners that um, the, the plant isn't really creating much backwater. Um, and if we would be able to show them that this, this is the case, then we would be allowed to uh, move further upstream um, where there's much uh, smaller volume flow and also the concentrations are much higher. Um, but that was a little bit problematic. Uh, as you can see here on the pictures, <clears throat> um, the site wasn't suitable for that kind of uh, plant as, at all. Uh, so there's, there was a uh, high water flow, high groundwater table. As soon as you started to dig, the groundwater would come up. And the fine sandy substrate uh, didn't allow us to like place the plants and uh, protect it, uh, protect it at, uh, against the water flowing around it. Uh, so we had to dismiss that side and realize that uh, the plant can't really be dug in in that area because the sand uh, or the soil, the substrate is um, yeah, almost the same in, in, that, in that catchment area. Um, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit of filter. Um, the, the second 
second construction site uh, was was now uh, on ground so we bought uh, for for that um, for that project uh, field here next to the later ditch and close to the later river so we had to uh, decide that we pump the water up and uh, this was only to test uh, denitrification efficiency. So uh, on the upper picture, you can see uh, in the early construction stages, uh, the pots, six pots uh, that built the, the mobile wetland. Um, it's a combination of plants on the surface that you can see down here. Um, they are for aeration, so there's a potential for uh, nitrification there as well. And according to the developer, nutrient uptake, but I think that's um, yeah too small to really uh, take into account. And um, inside of the, the pots there, we have plastic carriers and burnt clay, just to give uh, my microbial growth some kind of a surface. Um, yeah, the upper part is filled with burnt clay and the flowers and the lower part is the root system, the burnt clay and the plastic carriers. Uh, we are using a 50 watts pond pump to uh, supply the, the insulation with water. Um, would have been nice to find a pump uh, with less uh, energy or less power to fill it, um, but sadly this is uh, the lowest or the smallest one that we could find that uh, was able to uh, get the height difference. Uh, each pot holds around 750 liters um, and uh, inside there are the plastic carriers as you can see them here and we filled the plastic carriers as you can see on the lower picture uh, with burnt clay just to further increase the, the surface area. Um, if you look on the pure water volume that can be held inside of those pots, it's around 1.5 cubic meters. And um, yeah, we use green nets to, to uh, keep, the, keep the burnt clay in place so it, it doesn't float around and at some point you don't have any clay anymore in the first couple of pots. Um, yeah, we made sure that the inflow is diverted to the bottom so it goes down through the plastic carriers and the clay and then it rises up again through the uh, further pipes. And for six parts, we paid around 6,000 euros. <coughs> uh, here's the monitoring uh, equipment. Uh, we have pipes on the inlet and outlet, just like this. Uh, and our multi-sensor or multi-parameter sensors are directly uh, yeah, put into those pipes. We measure nitrate concentrations, uh, total suspended solids, water temperature, uh, chemical oxygen demand, like equivalent. Uh, so it's not directly measured, but it's some kind of equivalent. And um, O2 concentrations are monitored in a 15 minute, uh, yeah, every 15 minutes. And um, what we're going to do uh, in the in the future is that we regularly check uh, the the measurements with uh, lab analysis and see if that's correct or not. So the power supply is a little bit more difficult here because it's quite a remote area where we don't have a connection to the power grid. So we use uh, on the one hand we use solar panels and uh, we use an electric cell as well that works with methanol. Uh, the solar panels of course uh, power the pump and fill the car battery that we have there as well during day and during sunshine. Um, but because we're in northern Germany, sunshine is not that abundant. Um, so uh, we use the electric cell to, to fill the battery and, char uh, and, and uh, power the pump. Uh, during the night and cloudy weather. <clears throat> uh, what we can see now, uh, since uh, the weather has gotten quite bad in the last one or two weeks, uh, that the fuel consumption is now really high. Uh, we use only one solar panel for the pump and the other one for, um, for the uh, multi-parameter sensors, but we might change that setup a little bit. Um, so we use two panels for the pump, one electric cell for the pump and another electric cell for um, 
the, um, the sensors probably. Um, and we are going to the results. Uh, we finished construction only last week because we had a month-long struggle to find a, um, a pump that is actually working for us and um, that was yeah, a bit of a hassle. Um, but you can see here that uh, the data that, that we have shows two distinct uh, phases now, uh, so we have loading phase, the pots were full already. Um, <clears throat> we had some trial runs with, with pumps and a generator. Um, so there was water already inside for a long period of time and we had uh, lots of rain, rainfall. So there was a, yeah, quite a low nitrate concentration uh, for extended period of time. Um, that's why we can see here now in the growth phase that uh, a potential between input, which is the blue upper line, and the output, which is the uh, lower orange line, is still quite uh, low. So we have around six to nine percent of denitrification right now. Um, but I hope that it's going to grow further. So I expect that the nitrate concentrations were too low for um, the biofilm to establish properly um, and then it just takes maybe two or three weeks uh, if the weather condi conditions stay favorable um, so it might take them two or three weeks for the biofilm to further establish. Uh, we have here some kind of uh, dilution uh, event maybe there was a, a localized rain event, so that's possible. And here, there's just uh, the sensors maybe cleaning themselves. They have some kind of windshield wiper. It's just a 15 minutes where there is no value. Um, yeah, we have to check if that is going to continue. Yeah, and uh, the issue there is uh, that, especially now during winter, when the temperatures are dropping below eight or six degrees Celsius, um, there might not be any uh, detectable denitrification anymore, depending on the water temperatures, of course. But we just have to see how it goes. And I think uh, the most important uh, yeah, time will be next year during, during uh, spring and summer. Yeah, so what we're going to do next is um, we will change, as I already mentioned, we are going to change a little bit the power supply so we don't have to use that much fuel. Um, and uh, there might be, I think I forgot to mention it. Um, so we have like around 70 milliliters per second, which uh, flow through the, uh, the installation, which means a retention time of around five to six hours. We might, uh, or we, we are going to check if uh, an increase in retention time will do the trick. Uh, but it's also possible that uh, low carbon levels might hinder the microbial growth. Um, so we have, like a TOC of three milligrams per liter. So we might need to yeah, substitute the clay or mix the clay, at least in the first pot uh, with wood chips so we can increase the, the carbon levels or give them a carbon source to feed on and uh, see how that goes. Yeah. So thank you very much for your attention and um, looking forward to questions. Okay. Thank you, Sasha, for your uh, presentation. Are there any questions for Sasha? There are no yet in the chat. Uh, but Sasha, I, I have a small question. Perhaps you told it, but it was not clear to me. But how long does the water stay in the pots now currently? Also, the yeah, the, the retention time? time is around five to six hours now. So we might need okay. to increase it until eight hours. So that might be helpful as well. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we know from uh, former experiments that it's important to give some time to the biofilm to grow. So I think uh, we really need to wait and see how the things are developing. But yeah, the carbon source will indeed be important. Eh? So um, yeah, you might uh, have a chat with Peter just to see how they managed uh, to do so. Um, now, 
I have a, a question. Uh, so somebody said uh, it's an interesting setup. Uh, what, what is the aim of this setup to install mobile wetlands? And is it then comparable to natural wetlands, which are digged into the soil? I will just read out all these questions. Eh? Um, could it be used to translate the natural capacity of wetlands nitrogen removal? Or is it the aim to create super efficient wetlands for any removal? So the, the goal was to see if we can attach those, um, those wetlands um, to, or if, if, it, if it would be possible to at attach them to drainage pipes. Um, in our area, we have the problem that there is not much space. And um, the issue with the river, for example, is that there is not, a much, uh, not enough water in there, especially during summer, to, to supply the, the, the fish ponds. So we can't really uh, uh, build natural um, wetlands. So we, th we thought about that uh, in, the, in the first stage of the project, but we had to sadly to dismiss it because that would have brought, of course, some, some uh, other positive uh, effects for, for the natural protection area. So the, the main goal behind it is to dig it in the ground and then uh, let drainage pipes run through it. And um, yeah, and Hopefully, it would be uh, efficient and or more efficient uh, than a natural uh, wetland. Uh, we don't see it yet. Uh, we might see it uh, next year uh, during during uh, spring. But yeah, that's that's one of uh, the main goals here to see if it's if it's working properly and uh, that's a possibility to to dig it in the ground and attach it to drainage pipes. Um, not sure if I missed the question. No, you answered most of it. The, the thing is indeed that uh, it's something new and it's just started now and we just need to wait a bit longer to see what results are and how it performs as compared to natural wetlands. Uh, but let's hope it, it does it very good, yeah. Uh, then I have an other question. Uh, do you measure nitrite, not nitrite, but nitrite in the outflow? Uh, because uh, it's Leonard who is asking the question. They had some problems with the nitrate in their bioreactor, especially in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are not measuring that, uh, but that's uh, definitely an uh, interesting point to do some kind of regular lab analysis on that because it would be, I think, way too expensive to uh, include another another uh, sensor for that because it's quite expensive that monitoring setup uh, but uh, we can look definitely into uh, some kind of regular lab analysis on that because we have to do it anyways to check if the if the sensors are working properly okay Uh, Sasha, then you also mentioned that you think that um, by next year you will know better if the system will be working, especially in the spring. So we know that the nitrates are mainly uh, leaching uh, during the winter because of the rain. So it also has a diluting effect on the, on the concentrations, of course. When you did your monitoring campaign, you did it. Do you have an idea of the nitrate fluctuations during a whole year? Yeah, so of course during the winter or especially at the start of the, of the uh, drainage season, um, the, the concentrations are higher. Not that much, not that much higher um, than what we can see during summer. So during summer we had um, comparable, comparable uh, levels to now, maybe a few percent lo lower, but not that much. Okay, yeah. Um, there are no questions in the chat anymore. Does anybody else has a question for Sasha? No? Okay, then thank you, Sasha, for your presentation. And thank then you. I uh, invite Peter to take the floor and to tell us something more about uh, moving bed bioreactors to remove uh, 
nitrates. Okay, thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so, hello everybody, I am Peter van Aken. Um, I'm working on a, in a research group at uh, KU Leuven. Um, and we developed a, a system to remove nitrate from um, yeah, drainage water. So what we have done is uh, try to translate um, as a, a technology which is used in industrial uh, wastewater treatment, and it's the moving bed bioreactor, and we can translate it to the application of treating uh, greenhouse effluent or uh, drainage water. Um, why we did it um, is because we, we try to reduce the, the, the area which is taken by um, conventional techniques um, like um, um, constructed wetlands or so on. Um, the work is not only my work uh, I present today, it's a uh, work of uh, Professor Abdeville as well and my other colleague uh, Nico Lambert. Um, we did the, the main focus about uh, the development of the technology um, and development of the concept, whereas the implementation uh, we work together with uh, different partners, but that will be clear throughout uh, the presentation. So uh, our system is based on biological denitrification, as we have seen also by uh, in the previous presentation. Um, so we use anoxic conditions to convert nitrate into nitrogen gas. Um, it goes indeed over uh, different types of um, nitrogen molecules, let, let's say, and nitrite, um, nitric oxide and nitrous oxide. Um, where it is important that the complete, uh, the reaction um, will be completely, um, so th that the conversion will be complete um, because um, some, some nitrous oxide is a little bit dangerous uh, as well um, because of the, the impact on global warming. So that's something we, we keep in mind. Um, the nitrogen gas uh, that we produce, it's also a little bit a disadvantage of this system, so we cannot recover any um, nitrogen. Yeah. What we need is indeed a carbon source. Um, we use a, a glycerol-based carbon source, um, but I will tell later on why we, why we use this type of, of uh, carbon source. Um, to intensify this reaction, um, we used uh, the, the technology of, of moving bed. Um, so it's a biofilm we, um, which will grow onto plastic carriers and it's all the anoxic coldness carriers. And we use a type uh, K5. Um, why we use this one? Because it has a, a lot of specific area. So it's around 800 square meters per um, cubic meters of, of plastic carrier, so it's quite a lot. So we, lo we have a lot of area on which the, the biofilm can, can grow. Uh, the benefits of the system is we have a, a very high active biomass concentration, higher than in, in conventional systems. Um, so this will reduce the footprint of our uh, total installation. Additional, um, like if you compare to suspended solid systems, um, the, the biofilm is attached to the, the plastic carriers. So afterwards we don't have any, or, or the, the biomass will grow a little bit slower as well. And that's, that's the reason why we don't have any um, problems or we don't need um, any treatment afterwards to, to remove the sludge from the, the water. And additional, we can treat quite high um, nitrate concentrations as well. Um, before yeah, going to the, the MBBR concept we developed, we uh, first we had to look at the different types of waters we have to, to treat. Um, and here in Flanders, we, we consider two types of waters. It's the, the, the drainage water coming from tile drains, agriculture fields. Um, this type of water will, is only um, present in, 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 in winter conditions, so um, from November to April. Now, because of the dryness, uh, the two former years, we, it's only from December to March. But, so it's uh, in a really short time that a lot of water will, will come uh, from the, the tile drain fields. 
So it's our quite high uh, flow rates um, and also some fluctuating um, concentrations. So we go around 50 to 200 milligrams nitrate per liter, whereas the uh, threshold value is around 50 milligrams nitrate per liter. Uh, the other type of water are, is coming from greenhouses. Um, so they try to reuse their water as much as possible. Um, and their drain water, it's reused, but at a certain moment, um, there is uh, some, some cations, for example, are too concentrated within that um, reused water. And then they have to discharge a, a small amount. So the, the flow rates are much lower. Um, and it can come throughout the, the whole year. Um, because of our low flow rates, also the concentration is a little bit higher, eh, up to 400 milligrams nitrate per liter. And in some cases, the, um, the, the farmers are able to collect all the, the water for, for one year, for example. Um, so it gives us a whole year time to treat that amount of water. So we can work at a con continuous uh, flow rate, continuous concentration, and the conditions are a little bit easier um, with this water. So um, while designing the concept, we have to consider uh, some, some um, important um, items and, and it's the, the variable flow rates and nitrate concentrations. Uh, we need also a, a simple and robust system um, in, um, in, in wastewater treatment. It, it's quite complex because there are a lot of um, things are measured and controlled. So we, we try to go to a simple and robust system. Um, also because it are, um, the locations are quite remote, so we have to keep it in mind. The budget is also important in, in this story. And um, because uh, like uh, drainage water is coming in, in winter conditions, we have quite low water temperatures and for biological denitrification it's not so um, yeah um, it's not optimal to work at those low uh, water temperatures and therefore we did uh, a long-term experiment in our lab um, so we compared two um, reactors they are totally the same um, only the temperature differs between both so we had two reactors of 13 liters they are continuously stirred as you can see in the video um, so the elements are moving around, um, um, as you can see, and there is all, um, approximately 30% carriers present um, within the, the director volume. Uh, we use a different type of carriers just to keep them moving because the K5s are too big uh, for those small uh, reactors. The inlet concentration was 150, or around 150 milligrams nitrate per liter, and we had a um, carbon to um, nitrogen ratio of 8 to 10. It's really high, uh, quite high, um, because we, we want optimal conditions to remove all the, the nitrate. The carbon source we used is CarbST. Um, it's a commercial product. Um, crystal based so it won't freeze in uh, winter conditions and eh? so when it's very cold um, that's one reason second reason it's it contains a lot of carbon um, we can pump it quite easy and that's also necessary some practical issues um, um, and um, additional we yeah depending on the type of carbon source you use um, it has an effect also on the pH and the, the biological identification pH will, will change but um, this type of carbon source is able to to buffer the pH and we only um, see the pH differs between 6 and 7.5 so we go not um, below or above this pH range so it's um, ideal for us. Um, you see we also add a little bit um, phosphate. Uh, it's a little bit strange because we want to remove also the phosphate from the drainage water, but we need it to to um, enhance the the biofilm growth. So, um, but we monitor the the effluent, of course, um, and and if 
everything is going well. We see no um, uh, phosphor, phosphate going out of, of our reactor. So everything is taken up by the, the biofilm. So indeed, uh, the left reactor, we, we have some temperature control on it and we go to 10 and 5 degrees, as you will see in, in the results. From the results, I only show the, the nitrate concentration because otherwise we have, it will take too much time. Um, but you see on the left y-axis the nitrate concentration indeed. Um, whereas the, the influent nitrate concentration is, is, um, is represented by the, the blue dots. The orange dots are the results um, from nitrate concentration in the cooled um, MBBR. And then one MBBR is at room temperature and it are the green dots. The black dashed line, it represents the temperature profile in the cooled um, MBBR. And you see we go in the beginning, it's indeed 20 degrees. And then we go to 10 degrees and then around two, day 200 here, we go to uh, five degrees. <coughs> So in the beginning, we indeed um, started at 20 degrees in both reactors just to have optimal biofilm growth. And you see, we remove all the nitrate or almost all the nitrate with which is coming in. That's also due to the, the very high um, uh, hydraulic retention time and it's seven, 27 hours, it's, it's really long, but this was necessary to, um, to let the biofilm grow. Around day 50, I think, we reduced the temperature to 10 degrees and we applied a uh, hydraulic retention time of 12 hours and it's something uh, we can um, apply into the field. And um, we see that the, the nitrate concentration in the effluent of the, the cooled reactor is a little bit higher in the beginning um, than the, the MBBR at 20 degrees. Indeed, at, at 10 degrees, it's uh, more difficult for the MBBR to adapt to the, the change circumstance, circumstances, I'm sorry. Um, but afterwards, we, we are able to, to remove the nitrate below the, the threshold value of 50 milligrams uh, per hour. Um, at the end of this cycle, uh, of this phase, um, we have some fluctuating um, effluent concentrations, a little bit higher as, as we, we had before. Um, and that was uh, caused by the yeah, shortage of carbon sources. So we had some problems for uh, pumping the, the carbon source into our reactors. Um, and then you indeed see immediately an, an increase of, of the effluent concentration, uh, which is also uh, logical. Afterwards, we um, decreased the temperature to five degrees, uh, but at the same hydraulic uh, retention time. Um, and then we see that the effluent concentration of the uh, MBBR at five degrees are a little bit higher than um, the effluent concentrations of the, the um, MBBR at 20 degrees. Um, so yeah, at, at five degrees, the nitrification rate will be a little bit, it uh, will be lower. And that's something we see um, in the effluent, of course. But we are still below the, the threshold value of 50 milligrams per liter. So it is quite uh, uh, good. Now for the um, hydraulic retention time at eight um, hours, and we lowered it to eight hours, but um, we had some problems here about uh, yeah, follow up and so on. Um, so this phase we are repeating at this moment. Um, we want to go to eight hours just to see if we can um, lower the re retention time in our systems um, at, in the field as, as well. But that's something we, we are doing right now. Um, so it, uh, it will come those results. So based on, on um, what we have uh, noticed in the lab, we started um developing an, a main concept for treating uh, those type of waters um, and therefore we we choose to go to a drainage well um, it can be a couple of liters but it can also be one cubic meter for example 
Um, it's just a well from where we can pump up the drainage water into our uh, MBBR system. Um, different as in the lab, we, we won't steer or, or mix the, the um, MBBR reactor. Why we don't do this, um, and then it's not a really moving bed. Uh, we know that it's, um, it costs a lot of energy uh, and a lot of money um, to, to buy such a, such a system. Um, therefore, um, we, we try to do it differently and we try to um, mix the, the water around with the pump. Um, and sometimes we add a little bit um, oxygen. So we irate the, the total reactor. It's a little bit strange, but because we want anoxic conditions, but um, the aeration is just for a small period of time and it will lift up the total um, bed and all the carriers are, are mixed together again, just for a short period of time. Um, and the oxygen is also needed to remove some, some bad um, smells from the reactor as well. So we have some advantages of um, the, the aeration. And we followed up the, the um, oxygen concentration in the reactor and it, uh, it won't uh, change. So um, it, just for this short period of time, a couple of times per day um, is more than enough and it doesn't change our uh, anoxic condition. Um, the mixing pump is also used to, to um, remove the, the treated water again to, um, to the ditches or to the surface water. Um, so the discharge is also done by this pump. Um, what you also see is that the, the effluent pump, the influent pump and the carbon source pump are controlled by um, a level controller. And there is a particular reason for it and I will show you. So we work at different phases. Um, we measure the A level in our MBBR. We have a low level and a high level. And as we start, I'm gonna start at phase four. It's a little bit easier to explain. And so the low level here is reached. And then the influent pump and the carbon source pump will start pumping into our MBBR. So uh, the um, drainage water and the carbon source are mixed together and pumped into the react reactor. Um, and then we go to phase one. You see that the level is going up. Both pumps are working as well. And then when the high level is reached, both pumps will, will stop pumping and um, the effluent pump will, will start pumping through here and, and then the level will go down to the low level and then we are back to, to phase four. And so that's the, the way of, of um, adding the carbon source, source to the, the reactor and the concentrations, um, the, we, we know the concentrations more or less um, and we can um, change here the amount of carbon we pump together with the, the, the drainage water. There is also a level measurement in our drainage well, it's just to, to prevent um, the, the influent pump um, that it will work, that the influent pump will work um, when the level is too low and, and yeah, it will work at, at, uh, without any water, so that's not so good for the, the pump. Um, and then based on the, the type of water and, and the, the, the type of location, we, develop, the develop, we developed uh, three concepts um, and the, the implementation of those concepts um, we, we did it together with, with uh, the different partners here in Flanders. Uh, the first concept is the cell assembly, assembly concept. Um, and it's together with PCS. Uh, it's the Ornamental Plant Research uh, Group uh, at Destelbergen. And it's a system um, based on a universal cubic container, and uh, it's one cubic meters, um, which the farmers can build and sell. It's to treat greenhouse effluent, and so it's, it's a low flow rate indeed. Um, and and the, the, yeah, the main advantage is that the investment cost is quite low. It's only 3,000 euros. The operational cost is about uh, 1,000 euros per year. 
Um, this is mainly the carbon source um, and the electricity needed um, for, for the pumps and, and to, to work the system. Um, what's also included in the operational cost is the time that the, the farmer needs to build the system and to maintain the system throughout the, the year. Um, and then we calculated um, an efficiency cost, uh, how much will it cost to uh, remove such amount of, of, of nitrate and we will come up to what, uh, 107 euros. I've got some results from uh, PCS. Um, throughout the year, they have some, uh, take some, took some samples at, at several days throughout uh, 2019 and 2020. Um, at 8th uh, of August, the system was, was started up, so there was no uh, nitrate, of almost no nitrate was, was removed. And um, two months later, at, in October, we had um, an efficiency around 70%, a little bit higher. So we go from 600 milligrams per liter to um, almost 150 milligrams per liter. Still too high uh, to, to achieve the, the threshold value, but it was a removal efficiency of, of more than uh, 70% at such a short notice. So it's, it's quite well uh, performance. Um, and then later that month, the nitrate concentration was a little bit lower, I much lower at the influent. It's um, a little bit higher than 100 milligrams per liter. And then we, are, we were able to remove all of the, the, the nitrate. Um, yeah, at, in November, there was no nitrate present in the influent. So there it's also um, nothing removed. Yeah. Um, and then one year later, during summer, they started up again. Um, and then we were able to achieve the, the high removal efficiencies as before. So um, it are, are very good uh, results. The second concept is to treat um, drainage water from tile drained fields. Uh, there we have two con concepts. Um, first of all, it is the, the container concept. So the MBBR is building in the container. Why we do this? Um, it's to, to keep in mind the weather conditions during winter. Um, so if we just will put the, the MBBR um, above surface like, like this without a container, then we will have uh, water temperatures of one and two degrees and that's too cold. And then we will have no uh, denitrification. Um, this system is a lot bigger and eh? we have eight cubic meters and we can treat 15 cubic meters a day. The investment cost is quite high and eh? it's uh, 37,000 euros. Um, that's indeed because of the, the container, um, because of the, the higher uh, volume and because we build the system above the, the ditch so it won't take any surface um, from the, 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 the fields of the farmer. Um, on the picture here above, you see some solar panels. The investment cost I represented here is without sol solar panels. The operational cost here is 2,600 euros a year. Um, much more carbon source is needed. And this is with um, keeping in mind the, the energy cost. Um, so if we use the solar panels and we can um, produce enough uh, electricity, the operational cost will, will go down with 1,000 euros um, approximately. I have no um, results in detail, but the removal efficiency was around 77%, whereas the inlet concentration was one, uh, 140 milligrams nitrate per liter. Um, because of the high investment cost, um, yeah, the efficiency cost was also a little bit higher and we go to 135 euros per kilogram um, nitrogen removed. And then the final concept is an underground concept, um, also to treat drainage, um, also to treat drainage water from tile drained fields. Um, there we use a concrete well and with a quite high volume, 15 cubic meters, 
we can treat the same amount of, of um, cubic meters per day and the flow rate is quite the same as the, the concept before. We might go a little bit higher, but um, that's what we, we will uh, try to achieve to treat. The investment cost was a little bit lower than the concept before and 30,000 euros was needed. The operational cost is um, quite the same, a little bit higher as the concept before because the inlet concentration is also a little bit higher. So we needed a little bit more uh, carbon source. Um, but because we can remove a little bit more nitrogen, the efficiency cost is also a little bit lower, so 105 euros per uh, kilogram nitrogen. So indeed, it's a, it's a concrete well, and here you see the 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 the, the um, um, I don't know the word in English. Um, you, the inlet of the the, the reactor. Um, here you see a picture without the carriers. Um, on the right you see the the picture with the carriers, and on the left picture you see the aeration is, is working quite well, and we have some some mixing over there. Um, in the on the picture in the middle, you see the the bead bags. Uh, in which the the, um, the the carriers are are present, and we added the two big packs into our reactor. And you see my colleague Nico is standing um, beside it. I have some results. It's our only results from the our first year, and during our first year, we we see that um, the, the the biofilm um, needs to grow. Um, and because only water is in winter conditions at cold temperatures, it goes a little bit slower. slower. So um, we have different values which are above the, the threshold value. And it's because of yeah, the, the, bio mis, the, the biofilm is not fully grown. That's one. Also, the, the flow rate was a little bit higher as we expected during design. Um, but now we, we try to uh, keep it in mind and we will start working a little bit sooner than um, um, November. So we will start in October uh, with, with treating the water over there. Um, and also we had some problems and because of the high flow rate, we needed more carbon source as ex expected. Um, it's just a practical thing, but we had only a vessel of 20 liters available um, and it was um, to, it was not enough to um, to overcome a certain uh, period, um, and and now we change it to uh, a vessel of 100 liters, so we can um, yeah the, the period will be extended by by a factor of five. Um, so we hope we will have next year or the coming uh, drainage season now some better results, um, uh, and that we can. Um, yeah, achieve a good removal efficiency and always be uh, below the, the threshold hold value. So um, that's my whole story and I'm hopefully there are some questions. Okay, yes, thank you uh, Peter for your presentation. Um, there is already uh, one question in the chat. Um, the question is, uh, is it not possible to mix your carriers by bubbling uh, with nitrogen gas or oxygen or another gas? Yeah, or do you use air rather than oxygen and would mixing be, with another gas be too costly? Yeah, another gas, eh, like uh, yeah, working with, with nitrogen gas or something, it will be too costly, I think. Also because the locations are quite remote. So, um, so we have to, to produce it in situ, in situ. So it's not, um, not so easy from a practical point of view, but it should be possible. Um, to use oxygen, it's not so uh, good because then we will change the anoxic conditions. Uh, air is also not so good because we pump in a lot of oxygen as well, 20% uh, of the amount is oxygen more or less. Um, but yeah, at, at the short period we do, it's, it, it doesn't change our anoxic conditions. So we, we need to keep the anoxic conditions um, while otherwise the, uh, the, the denitrification reaction will not um, 
I'm not a cook. Yeah. And how long is it that you mix? Now it's, I think, five minutes every two or three hours. Ah, okay. It's yeah. not that much. No. Um, we keep it in mind. Um, so we, if we have... Um, when, when the implementation was done, um, first we wanted to achieve good results with these um, uh, circumstances, so mixing for five minutes. Um, but if the results are very well, we try to um, increase the mixing time. Um, so we try to um, change the, the oper operational parameters um, so we can increase the, the, the maximum, the, the, yeah, the moving of the carriers. Yeah, okay. Then there is another question. Um, how do you manage to have the temperatures high enough in the container during winter periods? <clears throat> yeah, we, we measure the temperature. Um, we, um, as we, I, what we've measured in, in a, our very first concept, it were two uh, plastic um, vessels above ground. And there we, we saw that the temperature in those vessel, vessels was um, in, in very cold, freezing conditions, two to one and a half degrees. So it was very, very cold. Um, whereas the drainage water was coming in at six, seven degrees. So it's a difference of, of five um, degrees Celsius. It's, it's quite a lot for denitrification. Um, so we, Therefore, we, we um, propose the concept of underground uh, to keep the temperature and also the container, um, which is keeping the, the reactor vessel out of the, the winter conditions. So out of the wind, out of um, temperatures above ground. Um, now we are following it up. Um, and what we can do additional is we can isolate uh, the container as well. That is also a possibility we keep in mind if the temperature will, will drop below temperatures below uh, five degrees or something. What was then the temperature that you could measure in the container? If you know that your drainage water is around six degrees? Um, I, I don't know the results. Um, it's it's uh, with our partner of, of Inagro um, and I don't have all the details. So I cannot um, say it now, but I can ask it and uh, we, we can maybe publish it later on. Yeah, okay. But anyhow, the reaction uh, goes better as compared to the vessels that are just standing yeah, yeah, freely yeah. in the air, in the winds above. Yeah, at, at one yeah, degree, yeah. at one and a half or two degrees, there was no uh, denitrification. Now we have an average, average uh, denitrification rate of seven, what was it, 72 percent, something else. Mm, yeah. And, um, so it's quite high and quite good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions for Peter? Uh, then I still uh, have one, Peter. I was wondering, so um, you showed your underground system and it's nice, but uh, if you would consider a big catchment area, you would collect a lot of uh, drainage water and then your, uh, you say your buffer vessel would be too small, I think. Uh, um, would it be an idea if you have an area in which you have a, a natural depression uh, that you collect there your drainage water? It can even be a, a small ditch or something. And that at that location where you have a, a collection of big amounts of water that you dare install your MBBR eventually underground to have like an intensified denitrification as compared to the, the big natural wetlands. Yeah, it's, a, it's possible, of course. Uh, the, the, the drainage well is, is just something we need to pump, uh, to, to collect uh, the drainage water um, and then pump it into our uh, reactor. So we, if it, it's a, a ditch with, um, which is all where, where the water is present or the, it's, it's a pond, let's say, then it's also good for us. Um, we just need something to pump up the water into our uh, reactor. Yeah, yeah. So anyhow, if it's in a remote area, you would need to find a way to have yeah. electricity production so that you can 
activate your pumps. Yeah. The, why we, I, we, we came up with the concept of a drainage well of one cubic or two cubic meters uh, is because in, in the area here in, in Mechelen, nearby Mechelen, a lot of farmers, they, um, uh, their tile drain system um, will come up in a drainage well and they start pumping from the drainage well into the, the ditches. Um, so uh, there they have, an, an, I, they collect or they keep their water in the field as much as possible. And only when they um, need to, to work on the land and to, for the, the new season, um, for the, the, the vegetables and so on, and when they need to plant the, the new plants, then they um, start pumping away the water. Um, so the, you have some, some natural uh, catchment or, or you, you have a natural barrier so, um, to keep the water at, at place and not immediately to, to, the, to the surface water. Yeah, okay. Uh, then there is a, a new question. Uh, do you need to replace or to clean your uh, carriers from time to time? Um, that's a good question. That's something we don't know yet because we are just uh, measured for a couple of years now. Um, but it's important that your carriers are not completely filled um, with, with your biofilm or something else. Um, that's important and that's why we the, the mixing is necessary. Um, so normally you don't have to clean the carriers. Um, maybe uh, that's possible about 10 years, let's say. We have to, to remove some uh, biofilm that's, um, that's lost from the, the carriers but that, because that's um, also something that's possible. But yeah, that's something we need to, to keep in mind for a long period of time, over a long period, period of time. Yeah, indeed. I, I can imagine that the, the plastic itself will not be, uh, let's say, uh, gone in 10 years, but uh, I can uh, imagine that your biofilm will be completely uh, blocking your carrier. So let's yeah. wait for the future how, how we need to handle this. Yeah, indeed. Okay. Um, there are no more questions in the chats. I don't know if anybody else still has a question for Peter. Anyhow, I also want to um, explain to the audience that um, PCS drafted a manual uh, which explains how you can construct a do-it-yourself MBBR yourself. So people who are interested to start experiencing with the system, they could try to build it themselves and you can find the manual on our Interreg website. Okay, so, so this is, uh, yeah the end of a series of three webinars that we organized in the frame of the Nuridrain project. I want to thank all the speakers for their efforts. Uh, and of course, I want to thank the audience, audience to be present. So um, as announced, the handouts and the video will be um, posted on our website so that you can have a look to it if you want to later on. Uh, and uh, with that, I want to close this webinar. So thank you to all uh, the project partners for their continuing efforts. And thank you to the Interreg North Sea Region Programme for their um, support, as well as the province of Antwerp, East Flanders and West Flanders for their match funding. So thank you very much. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.